Hi, my name is Kristen Fiorino, and I'm here to discuss gastrointestinal manifestations of mitochondrial disease. The objectives today will be to understand how mitochondrial diseases are associated with gastrointestinal or GI disorders, as well as review common GI symptoms that patients present with and discuss some of the therapeutic options that target GI symptoms of mitochondrial disease. The United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation produced this statement, which I feel is powerful. We all have mitochondria. The mitochondria in the cells throughout our bodies are responsible for creating 90% of the energy needed to sustain life and support organ function. When mitochondria malfunction, organs start to fail, people get sick and even die. So what are mitochondrial disorders? Well, they occur about one in 5,000 children and happen when mitochondria fail to produce enough energy for the body to function properly. Symptoms may be acute or chronic with intermittent decompensation. Mitochondrial disorders are an inherited heterogeneous group of disorders that can affect the respiratory chain or not and can be syndromic or non-syndromic. They affect multiple organ systems with varying intensity, and more than 50% present with GI symptoms. At the basis of mitochondrial disorders, there are defects in oxidative phosphorylation. Oxfos refers to the metabolic pathway in which energy released by nutrients during oxidation is utilized to generate ATP throughout the electrical transport chain. In mitochondrial disorders, there are metabolic defects in OxFos. These errors are responsible not only for the reduction of ATP synthesis, but also for an increased reliance on non-aerobic metabolic pathways, such as glycolysis and glycogenesis to provide ATP. This in turn results in elevated serum lactate Additionally, uncoupled oxygen may generate reactive oxygen species, contributing to oxidative cell damage. So where does mitochondrial disease hide? According to this picture, nearly everywhere, it affects multiple organ systems as previously discussed. And today, the target is going to be on GI symptoms. So when we think about the symptoms of mitochondrial disorders, they vary because of the different organ systems that they affect. So patients can present with symptoms such as poor growth, short stature from malnutrition, hypotonia, vision and or hearing problems, as well as delays in development. Autism has been linked to mitochondrial disorders as we will discuss later, and also other symptoms such as neurological disorders, endocrine disorders, or respiratory failure. When we think of GI-specific symptoms of mitochondrial disorders, we think of a variety of different symptoms. Symptoms such as poor appetite can occur, and poor appetite then leads to weight loss, which presents as anorexia and or cachexia. Dysphagia can be secondary to smooth muscle defects or can be central nervous system in origin. Vomiting, which is common in MLS patients, can be cyclic. And gastroparesis is a common presentation in patients with meningi. Pancreatitis usually recovers, but tends to recur. And we either see increases in serum amylase or lipase and or radiographic imaging. MLS patients currently do present with recurrent pancreatitis. Regarding hepatopathy, patients can present with various different symptoms. We usually have an increase in liver function tests without an increase in bilirubin, and it is much more common in pediatric patients than in the adult patients. More rare manifestations of mitochondrial disease from a GI perspective include such things as tracheoesophageal fistula, 
or stenosis of the duodenal duodenal junction or anal atresia with imperforate anus. Patients can also present with pneumatosis coli, as you can see in the x-ray here, or recurrent bowel perforations. So again, a variety of different symptoms are the presenting symptoms for mitochondrial disease when there's GI involvement. This slide here just reviews how different mitochondrial diseases can affect the different organs of the GI tract, from the liver to the pancreas, to the small bowel, to the large bowel. Also listed here are the genetic defects associated with these mitochondrial diseases. This table lists a very detailed pathognomonic presentations of mitochondrial disorders that have prominent GI or hepatic involvement. And as you can see here on the left, more than 50% of the clinical features actually involve the liver. And that brings us to our next slide, which is mitochondrial disease in the liver. We need to know that the liver requires a continuous synthesis of ATP and hepatocytes have a high density of mitochondria. So as we spoke about earlier, when there are disorders or defects in osphos, there is a decrease in the synthesis of ATP. This then leads to changes in the liver with impairment of bile flow and steatosis, as well as cell death and fibrogenesis. About 10% of patients who have mitochondrial disorders actually involve liver dysfunction. So when we think about mitochondrial hepatopathies, symptoms include jaundice, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly at times, coagulopathy, ascites, various degrees of malnutrition, elevated LFTs, and steatosis, as we mentioned previously. And patients usually present in infancy with some degree of neonatal acute liver failure, or sometimes later in life with cirrhosis with chronic liver failure. Unfortunately, most of the mitochondrial hepatopathies are progressive and can be fatal. So I just wanted to speak about neonatal liver failure as it is common. It affects respiratory chain defects, most commonly affects complex four cytochrome C oxidase. Symptoms patients present with are lethargy, vomiting, hypotonia, poor suck, and neurological symptoms such as seizures. While some have benefited from liver transplant, liver failure is usually progressive within weeks to months and at most times is fatal. Two different mitochondrial disorders that are associated with neonatal, neonatal liver failure include mitochondrial DNA depletion syndrome and ALPERS. It is important to note that acute liver failure manifests not only with liver disease, but with a variety of different symptoms, including lung injury, cardiovascular collapse, brain edema with intracranial hypertension, and adrenal insufficiency. So we must think about liver disease when patients present with a variety of different symptoms. Now, over the next few slides, I wanna go over two mitochondrial disorders that present with predominant GI symptoms. Mitochondrial neurogastrointestinal encephalopathy, or meningi, and ethylmalonic encephalopathy, or EME. Meningi is a rare fatal autosomal recessive disorder that occurs secondary to thymidine phosphorylase deficiency. There are mitochondrial DNA depletions or deletions in skeletal muscle and affects complexes one, four, or a combination thereof. Approximately 120 cases have been reported to date and the mean onset of age is approximately 18 and a half with the average age of death at 37. Prior to onset, many patients are asymptomatic, but can have mild GI symptoms, including thin body habitus and short stature. There are some patients who present with GI symptoms in early infancy. When we think about meningi, there's a variety of different clinical presentations. 
you can see here that some patients have peripheral neuropathy, ptosis, myopathy. More than 50% present with some degree of hearing loss. From a GI perspective, more than half have symptoms, and the two most common symptoms are chronic intestinal pseudoobstruction and gastroparesis. And this is mostly secondary to enteric myopathy, leading to these symptoms in patients with meningi. Here's a nice slide just reviewing the different symptoms that patients present with. Again, from a GI perspective, patients can have severe GI dysmotility presenting as pseudoobstruction, have malabsorption leading to malnutrition. There is an asymptomatic glucoencephalopathy. Patients have ptosis, loss of vision, and have peripheral neuropathy. When we think about GI dysmotility, we need to understand the pathology behind it. What is known is, is that patients with meningi have visceral myopathy. There is atrophy and fibrosis of the external layer of the muscularis propria of the small intestine, as well as neurogenic changes to the myenteric plexus and ganglion cells. The mitochondria also are abnormally shaped and can be large in the smooth muscle cells of the small intestine, as well as ganglion cells of the entire GI tract. There is noted mitochondrial DNA depletion. This was selectively noted in the muscularis propria external layer of the small intestine where there was atrophy and fibrosis. This established a link between abnormal mitochondrial DNA genetics and visceral myopathy. Lastly, some of the recent studies have shown that there is depletion of the interstitial cells of Cajal in the smooth muscle. Interstitial cells of Cajal are the pacemaker cells of the smooth muscle, small bowel, and when they are absent, there's a decrease and disruption to the smooth muscle propagation and contractions, and hence patients present with various degrees of GI dysmotility. When we think about the genetics, there's an imbalance of the mitochondrial nucleoside pool secondary to disorder of thymidine phosphorylase. The shortage of thymidine phosphorylase leads to imbalances in DNTP, which then causes alterations in the rate and fidelity of the mitochondrial DNA replication. As I mentioned earlier, altered interstitial cells of Cajal has also been implicated in the genetics behind patients with meningi. As you can see on the left, there is a small intestinal wall of a normal healthy individual and in the muscularis propria, there's the interstitial cells of Cajal. When these cells are present, this leads to the development, proliferation and survival of smooth muscle cells. On the right, you can see the small intestinal wall of a patient with meningi that has a disruption and depletion in the interstitial cells of Cajal, which then leads to abnormal muscle cells. When we think about how to diagnose meningi, we see lactic acidemia and raised CSF lactate and protein, as well as brain MRI with leukoencephalopathy. The skeletal muscle biopsies have ragged red fibers. Duodenal biopsies have focal muscle atrophy, can have serosal granulomas, and loss of Auerbach's plexus. Rectal biopsy has been shown to have eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusions, which are abnormal mitochondria in the submucosal ganglion cells. Unfortunately, there's, treatment has been minimal and is limited to stem cell transplantation in patients with meningi. There can be supportive help with parental nutrition. And given the recent studies, of the interstitial cells of Cajal, future prospects include augmentation of kit signaling to help produce improved smooth muscle cells, as well as targeting 
voltage sensitive ion channels, which contribute to GI secretions, absorption, and regulation of gut contractions. Studies have supported transplantation of interstitial cells of cajal or bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells to enhance engraftment proliferation and function of the injured intestines. These are all exciting new studies being looked at in order to help patients with meningitis. The other mitochondrial disorder that I wanted to speak about with ethylmalonic encephalopathy. It is a rare, fatal, rapidly progressive autosomal recessive disorder that has more than 80 known cases with 60 different mutations. Onset is usually in, with persistent diarrhea at around two to four months of age. Other clinical symptoms include petechiae, Neurological symptoms secondary to symmetrical necrotic lesions in the basal ganglia and brainstem and orthostatic acrocyanosis. Newborn screening identifies elevated C4, which is also seen in SCAD deficiency. Serum shows elevated lactic acidemia. There's also elevated urinary excretion of ethylmalonic and methyl succinate acids and increased serum C4, C5 acylcarnitines. Muscle biopsy when done shows a reduction in cytochrome oxidase. And it is known the genetics that defects in ETHE1 leads to the accumulation of hydrogen sulfide. And this hydrogen sulfide is a potent inhibitor of COX and also blocks mitochondrial short chain fatty acid oxidation. In some patients, liver transplantation has been successful. The so one symptoms that are listed here are other mitochondrial disorders with GI symptoms that I wanted to briefly review prior to going into the therapeutic options. So Pearson syndrome, it's a defect in large scale mitochondrial DNA and presents with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency as well as a macrocytic anemia. You can see sideroblasts in the red cells on the right. Patients present with chronic diarrhea and fat malabsorption that leads to malnutrition. Pancreatic insufficiency leads to diabetes neutropenia to frequent infections, anemia to pale skin and fatigue, thrombocytopenia to bleeding. Patients present with marked hepatomegaly and steatosis, as well as cirrhosis that can eventually lead to liver failure and death. Patients with Pearson usually have a lactic acidosis and renal Fanconi syndrome. Now, chronic villus atrophy syndrome is similar to Pearson syndrome in that it presents with diarrhea in, the, in infancy. It is secondary to a complex three deficiency. Unlike Pearson syndrome, it does not have pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. And that is the hallmark between these two disorders. Now, Kearns Sayer syndrome is secondary to spontaneous mitochondrial DNA mutation presenting with ptosis and a pigmented retinopathy. Regarding the GI symptoms, most patients present with a degree of malnutrition, short stature, as well as vomiting. Lee syndrome presents with nonspecific GI symptoms such as vomiting, poor feeding, and failure to thrive. And gastroparesis is extremely common in patients with Lee syndrome. So we must consider different mitochondrial disorders when patients present with such nonspecific GI symptoms in childhood. Now, MILAS, or mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes are, are another disorder that present with GI manifestations. Initial manifestations regarding MILAs, as you can see here, with more than 25% are short stature and recurrent headaches, stroke-like episodes, cortical vision loss. And when we think about the GI manifestations, it's secondary to a defect in the MTTL1 mutation 
and approximately three quarters of patients present with GI manifestations. Vomiting and recurrent pancreatitis are two of the most common GI manifestations. In addition, a lot of patients with MILAs have some degree of gastroparesis or gastric dysmotility and can present with intestinal pseudoobstruction. The extra, ex, excuse me, extra intestinal manifestations are listed on the right here. Lastly, when we think about the GI tract, we think about the bacteria that lives in the GI tract. There are dramatic changes over the first 18 months of life as the body adapts to environmental changes. We believe that mitochondria are evolutionarily derived from bacteria. And we know that antibiotics, PPIs, and environmental exposures can all influence the host bacteria, the intestinal microbiome, and hence cause mitochondrial dysfunction. There was a recent study that was done to look at patients with autism, and they looked at the microbiome in the lower GI tract of both healthy individuals and individuals with autism. And it is believed that the GI tract with individuals with autism have a larger amount of dysbiotic bacteria as compared to commensal bacteria. And because of this imbalance, there is a increase in oxidative stress, inflammation, and mitochondrial dysfunction in patients with autism. And you can see that is most prevalent in the cecum where most of the mitochondria are. Now, lastly, I want to review diagnostic and therapeutic modalities of these GI manifestations. This slide is just a list of the different screening tests that could be done. It is extremely detailed. However, it does go over the large amount of studies that can be looked at in order to screen for mitochondrial disorder. Nutrition is a very important therapy. And we know that diet composition influences mitochondrial function. Refeeding, unfortunately, is a complication, and albeit rare, it is associated with a high morbidity and mortality. So these patients must be watched closely. We know that energy needs should be estimated at around 30 kcal per kilo and protein needs at about 1 to 1.5 grams per kilo. We know that as calories are increased, there is a rapid transition from a catabolic to anabolic state, and there can be electrolyte derangement and fluid shifts. Studies have shown that almost 70% reduction in GI symptoms with enteral feeds, which is outstanding. One must avoid fasting because fasting can worsen fatigue and increase metabolic acidosis. When we think about some of the nutritional supplemental options, you see them listed here, anything from carnitine to riboflavin to arginine and citrulline, as well as parental nutrition. The ketogenic diet, which is a diet that is high in fat and lower in carbohydrates, is really great for some type of refractory epilepsy because it is neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory. When patients come to us with dysphagia, we must screen them. We screen with modified barium studies, feces, and upper GIs. We look at esophageal manometry to look at cricopharyngeal achalasia, as well as the lower esophageal sphincter in the body. These images here show cricopharyngeal achalasia, both on esophageal manometry and on radiographic imaging. Textures must be adapted to facilitate swallowing, and enteral attrition is sometimes needed, either through a nasogastric, nasodejunial, or G or GJ tube. When we think about the diagnostic modalities of how we look at these patients and diagnose them from a GI perspective, there's a variety of different studies, including gastric emptying scan to look for gastroparesis, sometimes an endoscopy and colonoscopy to look at underlying pathology, as well as full thickness biopsies when patients are in surgery. Different types of breath tests will look for small bowel bacterial overgrowth, and we use various different types of manometry to assess the function regarding myopathies and or neuropathies in patients with mitochondrial disorders. Various therapies can be used for patients who present with SIPO or pseudo-obstructant symptoms. 
and they're very they're listed here um, in terms of the different organ systems that are affected. Again, a variety of different medications can be used. Um, most importantly, is some degree of enteral nutrition to build up the body and to prevent malnutrition and at times parental nutrition. Lastly, therapeutic options include pergidostigmine and procalopride, which both help increase acetylcholine and increase bowel peristalsis, which increases bowel motility. Both of them have been efficacious in patients with mitochondrial disorders. Lastly, we know that liver transplant is available for mitochondrial hepatopathies and cell stem cell transplant for meningi. Other experimental therapies include use of metronidazole and n acetylcysteine for patients with EME to reduce the sulfide production, as well as adeno-associated viral and lentiviral mediated replacements for patients with EME and meningi, and this has been studied in mouse patients. I think there are lots of different therapies on the horizon for patients with mitochondrial disease, which leads us to our conclusions. Mitochondrial disorders are highly heterogeneous disorders and have a pleomorphic clinical features. GI and hepatic disturbance is often a common feature, and there are some discrete syndromes with clear genotype-phenotype correlations. Careful observation of clinical status may help expedite genetic diagnoses. One needs a detailed histological and biochemical analysis to help diagnose the majority of cases, however. And thank you very much for your time and attention.